Welcome to the world of marketing. This is chapter one. So this is the fundamentals and the basics and the core concepts of marketing. Now what's going to happen over the course of this book and these chapters is that you'll see the occasional concept return, re-emerge and be repeated to the point that if you ever find yourself really frustrated with a concept because it's just not going away, it keeps coming back, you can pretty much guarantee it'll show up on the exam or it will be useful for you to put into your exam answer. So let's get started. The first chapter is going to be an overview, give you some basics, give you some fundamentals, and let you start building a platform of understanding what marketing is, what marketers do, and whilst you've committed to studying marketing, what it is that marketing does in terms of the business. So kicking this off, each of the chapters has a sort of you are here approach and talks about delivering where we are in the book and the materials that uh, you need to understand at this point. So starting off now, this first part of the book is talking about the value decisions. Marketing is consumer led. Marketing is about understanding the needs and wants of our audiences and working with them. But to get there in the first instance, we also have to under understand ourselves, understand our organization, what it is we're capable of offering and what it is we want to offer before we start deciding what it is that the consumer is looking for and how well that matches what we're prepared to deliver. So in terms of who's a typical marketer, there's a lot of background. Uh, the thing about marketing, which it's a positive and a negative, marketing is a very broad discipline. When you get out and do this in business, you'll find a lot of people who call themselves marketers who haven't seen a marketing course in their life. Now, sure, you can get a copy of mine in your own business and call yourself an accountant, but you're probably not. Same way for anyone who hasn't run through the marketing major, is you can call yourself a marketer, but that doesn't necessarily make you one. In terms of where we work, we're across the whole spectrum. I happen to specialize in academic marketing, which is the teaching and marketing and the research into conceptual, theoretical and other developments. I've worked in business to business marketing. I was responsible for product development and actually worked as an engineer uh, for a software company. Similar things that I've done have also involved, I'm part of a series of social marketing, social change campaigns where uh, I've worked in either political marketing campaigns or worked on alcohol reduction campaigns where my job as a marketer has been to interpret data and come up with a broad strategic direction. So where do we work? We work across everything. We've been in non-profits, we're in government, we're in politics, we're in sport. In fact, uh, one area that really could use a lot of good marketers is sport. And what you'll find is that the role of the marketer can be at the strategic level, where we're talking about the big picture, what does this firm want to do, to the tactical level of how are we going to move a product from our shelf to the consumer's hands, and how are we going to do that this week. So the roles of marketing is, we've got this idea of the integrated marketing approach, the marketing orientation, it's this big broad view that says marketing's the holistic, the whole of the firm. At the same time, we also have this very small picture approach where marketing can just be limited to communications, to sales. You can find organizations that are about making things and then marketing's job is to look at what has been made and go, right, how do we fit that and match that up with the consumers. How do we find a consumer who's looking for something like it or something close enough? And the other extreme is we can have an organization whose role, where well, the role of marketing is to say, well, what is the consumer looking for? Can we make something to solve that problem? And we'll see a lot of entrepreneurs have a very broad, integrated marketing approach for the holistic. What is the need in the market? Yet at the same time, a lot of the big breakthroughs that we've seen in terms of product development have come from people going, I want to make 
this product. I've got a design, I've got a dream, I've got a vision. I'm going to build this product, then I'm going to see if I can find someone who wants to buy it. So from a technical perspective, the question, what is marketing? Now we have an official definition from the American Marketing Association. There is also an official definition from the British Chartered Institute of Marketing. The Australian Marketing Institute and the Australian New Zealand Marketing Academy elected not to create their own official definitions and instead said that they would support and endorse the American Marketing Association definition. So the idea is that rather than having geo-regional this is the Region 1 definition, CIM's got Region 2 and Australia would have Region 4, we, the Australian and New Zealand crew, elected to go with the Americans. So the definition that you will be needing to use as you progress through the semester and the definition that will apply for assignments, exams and other assessment tasks is the one that's on the screen at the moment. And it sees marketing as the activity, so marketing is a verb, it's a thing that we do. It's a set of institutions, so it has a role inside the organisational structure. And it's a process. So if you think about this in terms of marketing is something you can do, marketing is something you can be, and marketing is something that happens. So that's the first aspect and first element to be considering. The second element that's vital for you to look at and understand is the notion of the creation, communication, delivery, and exchange. This is the fundamental acts of marketing. We make something of value. We make something we can offer that has value, and that's our creation. We explain to the market that this offer exists and what this offer could do for the consumer. We then, if the consumer is keen on this, make certain that that offer can actually make it to the consumer. And if you've looked anywhere, gone shopping on Amazon, it says it does not ship to your home address, you'll understand the frustration of create, communicate without deliver. And lastly is the exchange of the offers of value. Now commercial marketing, the exchange is mostly money, but it can be more than money. It can be loyalty, it can be data, can be a whole series of other things that so long as we, the firm, value what we're receiving, in exchange, giving something of value to the customer, the marketing is in process. And the last part of this definition to be considering is the idea of the customer, the client, the partner, and society at large. Customers are the people who pay money. They may not necessarily be the people who use the product. The people who use the product, use the offer, are the clients. Now the customer and the client, client can be the same person. Or the customer and the client can be two separate people. If you buy a gift for a friend, you shout pizza for your mates, you're the customer, they're the clients. The partners are the other people involved in the marketing process. So these are the people who are in the business-to-business -business side, they are the retailers, the distributors, the wholesalers, the manufacturers. And lastly, and this is the new aspect to marketing that really only came into effect around 2007, which is when this definition was put out, is the idea that we need to be thinking about what does our offer do for society at large. And this is bringing an ethical component to marketing that hadn't been a part of the formal definitions previously. Now the question is, is what we're making an offering that has value for society at large? And if it is, excellent. If not, we need to reconsider that. So part of the society at large aspect is this notion of the stakeholder. And stakeholder theory is a big, broad, and beautifully researched area there are a lot of Australian academics who've put a considerable amount of effort into researching stakeholder theory. If you have the opportunity and the interest, look up the work of Michael Polonsky. He's done a lot of work in examining how stakeholders and stakeholder theory applies in marketing. From 
Your perspective for this semester, the main thing you want to be thinking about in terms of stakeholders is that there are a series of corporate stakeholders you need to worry about. The buyer, the seller, the investor, these are people who are have a role in the process. The buyers are not necessarily the customers, but they can be the intermediaries, they can be the people in the distribution. When we get to the distribution chapter and the business to business chapter, you can see the stakeholders of buyers coming into effect. The investors are the people who have put the money up for your operation to take place. These can be shareholders. Shareholders can be a different type of stakeholder. These can be the angel investors. These can be people from a Kickstarter campaign. And I'll point out that I'm going to actually be using quite a lot of examples from Kickstarter and encouraging you to really investigate and look at the Kickstarter process. The investor in Kickstarter is both a consumer and a stakeholder. So they have a two separate and linked roles there. Lastly, there are aspects of society at large, such as community or uh, citizens of different nations, so that when we actually start thinking about what is the impact of our marketing on society, these are some of the stakeholders that we consider. Now, two of the fundamental definitions you need to ensure that you understand and you separate in your own mind, and definitely separate when it comes time to writing it up, if it appears in an assignment or an essay, the difference between needs and wants. Now, from a marketer's perspective, the consumer is not quite a mythic creature, but the consumer is a very powerful part of what we do. Our aim is to understand what drives this individual or this group. What are their needs? So where are they at currently and where would they like to be? Now everyone has needs and everyone enrolled in this course has a need. They recognize, all of you have recognized that there is a difference between your current state, you have a limited knowledge of marketing, and your desired state, a larger knowledge of marketing, and that larger knowledge of marketing being the 13, 13 weeks of course content. Now the wants aspect is the interesting part. Knowing that there is a difference between where you currently are, a limited knowledge of marketing, where you would like to be, an expanded knowledge of marketing, the ways in which you can satisfy that particular need are your wants. Do you want a textbook? Do you want to come to class? Do you want to just read the text? Do you want to watch the videos? And nothing else. How do you want to satisfy that gap between the amount of marketing you know and the amount of marketing you'd like to know? So separating needs and wants is an important part, and particularly when we talk about consumer behavior in a couple of chapters time, this becomes quite critical. But at this point, the way to think of it is that the need is that state change. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? The want is how are we going to create, how are we going to go from point A to point C? What takes place at point B is going to be the wants. So a couple of other conceptual frameworks. And one of the things that's beautiful about marketing is that it's a very theoretically rich discipline, but it's also a very pragmatic discipline. We experience marketing all the time. In fact, this particular PowerPoint slide contains a brand, a brand prompt and a set of marketing cues are taking place just on the slide alone. The marketing concept and the big theoretical framework that is underpinning this is marketing assumes that if we can understand the needs, what it is that someone wants to change about themselves, and we can create an offer to satisfy those needs, in the appropriate manner, in the culturally appropriate manner, in the society, in the manner that suits the consumer, the consumer is going to want to buy our product or use our product or engage with our product. And the thing about needs and wants is that they are recurring. So if we say, keeping with the example of this course, we know that you 
have a state change, you want to know more about marketing, you want to learn more. Now we can give you 13 weeks worth of content and that will be done. We can give you the book and that will be done. But if you want to keep learning more, if you want to keep understanding more, then you're going to want to find, if we're offering you lifelong learning or we're offering you a blog, maybe a Twitter account, maybe a YouTube video series, some way to keep that knowledge going, then we're going to meet those needs, that need, that thirst for information, that need to know more about marketing. And if we're charging you a fee for it that covers our costs, long-term profitability. The critical thing about the marketing concept here is that it's about the survival of the firm and it's about solving the problem that exists in the marketplace for an ongoing period of time. And one of the critical things about marketing is that if we can make, if we do our job well and we can make an offer to a consumer that meets that consumer's needs, we should continue solving that problem. And the profitability aspect and the marketing concept says, if we can do this repeatedly, then that's a problem solved for the individual. If we're solving their problems and they're satisfied and they're willing to continue supporting us to exist, we're able to continue solving that problem for them and making their world a better place. And that's the marketing concept at the high level. A couple of the other frameworks that are of real interest here, the difference between the benefit and the demand and the importance of understanding that in a marketer's way of seeing the world, we don't see objects and products. We don't sell you a can, a box. We sell you a benefit. We sell you a set of solutions. Now it sounds all high concept and a bit, well, pick your own adjective here. But if you think about it this way, if we are selling you the benefit, as the famous quote goes, people don't buy three quarter inch drills, they buy three quarter inch holes. Well, rather they buy the capacity to create the holes that they need. We're selling you a benefit. We sell you a car and all you want to do is drive from point A to point B, then we're selling you the benefit of transport. So the benefit aspect is that if we focus on that, then we can use a common group of features. So if we sell you bottled water, we can put a fancy logo on the front and sell you a status symbol. We can take the fancy logo away and put it in a pack of six, and we can sell you convenience. We can put it in a fridge and we can sell you the convenience on a summer's day of it being cold. We can push it into a four litre cask that uh, sits in the kitchen, use it for cooking. It's the same product, it's water, but we're selling you different benefits, different uses for it. So that's a critical area here that you need to be thinking at and looking at is what is the benefit my product can offer? What is the benefit that I'm seeking, particularly as a consumer and analyzing your own life now is when I buy something, what do I want from it? So I go out to dinner, what do I want? Do I want the convenience of food? Am I buying the flavor? Am I buying the facilitation of company and conversation? Am I buying the, I don't want to wash up tonight? Am I buying the, I'm hungry and this will be ready soon? What is it the benefit I'm after? And that's gonna help you understand when we come down to creating product offerings, how we can take one particular object and offer it across a whole series of different markets who have a whole series of different needs and wants. Now, a couple of times I've mentioned the term market and in our language, now marketing has a specific language, just like physics, just like finance, just like medicine. When we say the market, we're talking about a collection of consumers and customers. The market and the demand, so we talk about market demand, we're talking about a cluster of consumers. We deal with this quite a lot in this subject, and one of the aspects that we talk about is the concept of segmentation. And segmentation is where we take this broad, current, potential, everybody 
shaped market and break it down into smaller, useful and workable sizes. So we have our different market segments that help us go and identify who's most responsive and who will be the best customer for us to deal with. And which group of customers are going to be worthwhile for us to address our particular group of benefits to so that they get the best out of it and we get the best out of it. In terms of a couple other platforms and fundamentals about what we do as marketers, our idea is that marketing creates utility. Now, utility from a marketer's perspective is the usefulness you have from the buying, owning, or consuming of a product. And utility in this respect is ownership is one aspect that's useful. Mere ownership can be enough. Simply knowing you have this object makes you feel better. And this is the textbook as lucky charm approach. Then there's consuming the product. Actually reading the textbook. Different set of utility to owning it. Owning it can be the teddy bear. It can be the, I can bring this into a, uh, an open book situation and I've got my reassurance. I've got the book with me if I need it. Consuming it is I've read this book before I go into the open book situation, so I don't need to use it. So we've got the four different types of utility. It's worth your time going into that in a bit of depth, particularly if you've come from economics. The way we see utility, the way you have seen utility, might be one of these areas where we start having the incompatibility, where the language of marketing doesn't match the language of your other disciplines. But I'd also like to point out that one of the key things in marketing is that if you can create utility, so if we take the concept of the textbook and we were to break it down so that the textbook was available in individual chapters and those individual chapters were available in a shorter summary version that was, you could then drill down. You could get the summary, then the depth, and then if you felt like it, you could go off and do your own research. Breaking the textbook up from a single monolithic object into a series of smaller sub-objects could be time utility. It's now quicker to read. It could be place utility. You can read, you can access this information in different areas. Now, if this creates something valuable and something useful, then you have a new product, a new offer, and something of benefit to the market. The other major ticket uh, theory that you want to be familiar with, exchange theory. We'll brush over it briefly here. It does make a recurrence a couple of points in the semester, particularly when we get down to price, but also distribution. And exchange is value for value. For all of us who have our Facebook accounts, we get something of value from using Facebook, and Facebook gets value from us using it. So the data that we provide into Facebook in terms of our behaviours, what we like, who we friend, the games we play on, the side, the events we join, the marketing information that allows us to be targeted through Facebook advertising, that is a value to them and we are trading that for the value that we get from Facebook. Now in the exchange relationship there are a couple of fundamentals. Again, if you come from law, this will look a lot like contract law. The exchange relationship has a couple of fundamental principles that you can't violate without it ceasing to exist. So there has to be two people. You can't exchange with yourself. You have to agree on the value of the exchange. A coin for a car, that better be a very expensive coin, or you better have agreed that yes, this is worthwhile. Both parties need to be willing to trade. And this is important, if there's no willingness on one side, so coercion cannot be used in exchange. And this links to the last point, is that you have to be free to accept or reject the deal. If you can't reject the deal, it's not marketing and it's not exchange. It's something else, and it could be business, but it's not marketing exchange if you can't say no, you can't walk away, and 
you don't agree to the value transfer. So those are one of the fundamentals. You do need to be really mindful of that when you're starting to look in non-commercial marketing, when you start getting into government, voting and social change as a marketing tool. Where does the freedom to reject the offer come in? Can someone say, no, I don't want to be part of this? All right, time for a quick history lesson of marketing. Now this is the part that I just want to briefly give you a heads up on is we talk about marketing in terms of eras, production, selling, and relationship. These can also be considered phases. Now the production orientation of marketing says build it and build it effectively and build it efficiently. And then figure out once we're doing this really effective, efficient building thing, who's going to buy it. But first and foremost, make it. From an entrepreneur's point of view, and from a lot of startup organizations' point of view, production orientation is the first several phases where you come up with an idea and go, hey, I can make this. And you do. And having made your product, then you go find a market for it. Phase two, the selling era, is where you go, I have this stuff. What have I got to do to motivate someone to buy it? So in the production era, say you're looking at software, you've created a startup, you've created an application. And this application lets you order a taxi and a pizza at the same time, so you'll be delivered home with food to have when you get home. I don't know if that's useful, I just came up with it. In the production era, we make certain that we've got cabs that have got pizza printers in the boot. We look at microwaves, we look at heating devices, we build the most efficient pizza delivery car on the market. In the selling era, what we do is we go and say, well, how much would you pay for a pizza and a ride home and try and discount? Well, let's see, pizza's 20 bucks, cab homes, 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 30 bucks, pizza and a ride home. Friday night, 35 bucks, pizza and a ride home. And then we go out aggressively trying to get users, get people on board, try and get people adopting pizza in a, the pizza in the cab. On the way through, in the selling era, we also set up the foundation for things like the relationship era, where we go, well, listen, we'll give you five bucks off if you give us your email address and your phone number. And we start tracking re routine regular users. We start making them special offers. So rather than the you calling a pizza in a cab, the pizza cab combo rings you up and says, are you ready for pickup at the time that you have most frequently ordered a cab previously? And that's the relationship marketing is trying to anticipate those wants in advance. So the production era is make it and make it effectively, make it efficiently, but then try and figure out who wants it. Selling era is try to figure out what it is that we've got and how well that matches the needs of an existing market. And the relationship era is we already have customers. How do we make those customers happier with us so they buy more from us? I also like to point out the relationship era can actually be a really good thing. And I just felt like I came across as kind of cynical, but relationship marketing where you go, well, you're already part of our organization, you're committed, you're buying stuff from us. If we can improve your lot, if we can give you a product that's a bit better, customized, tailored, or do something to better understand your needs and give you a better outcome and keep you as a customer so that you're solving, we're solving your problem, you're getting an offer that's of value and we're getting an offer of value in exchange. A couple other elements, the triple bottom line, this is the idea, again, that there's more to life than just the money, and there is. In fact, as we're seeing at the moment, the financial bottom line has been a driver that's not necessarily understood. The, the social bottom line, now, if you don't have a functional community, if you don't pay your employees enough money so that they can spend in the community, and other people, other companies don't spend, pay their employees enough so that those employees can spend in the community, nobody gets to sell stuff. 
If everybody drives their wages down so that nobody's got any discretionary income, nobody has money to spend. And things go wrong for your economy. So the social bottom line and the financial bottom line are heavily intertwined. The environmental bottom line is now a key aspect of if you've got a community that's completely ravaged by droughts, floods, fires, and possibly all three at once, and a shout out to North Queensland for that, the environment is an important factor. We can't keep creating blindly situations where the environmental impact will have a knock-on effect to society and to the economy. And also, if we trash the environment completely, we have nowhere to sell our stuff, and that puts marketing out of business. So you can be socially responsible, save the environment for the sake of the environment. You can be socially reckless and financially focused and save the environment because it's more profitable to have somewhere that's functional than it is to have somewhere that's not. Okay, let's get down to a couple of fundamentals. In marketing, we talk about the term product. Now, product is one of the words that goes wrong for a lot of students. A product is a good service or idea. And quite often, I will hear people say products and services, which is basically saying goods, services, ideas, and services. So you want to say product as a collective, goods and services as the individual parts. Across the course of this semester, one of the assessment tasks that you always face will involve you selecting a product. And you may take an idea, you may take a service, and you may take a good. So you can take a physical object, you can take an act that is performed on you, or you can take a concept, and that can be your product. It's probably one of the most important things to really appreciate is when we're looking at the product, it's not just, if it's a physical object, it's not just the physicality. When you buy a smartphone, when you buy a fancy watch, when you buy a pair of shoes with an obvious brand, you're not just buying what the physical object does, you're also buying into the ideas around the brand and as one of the theories that came out in the early 2000s talked about, you're buying an embedded service. You're buying what the object can do. You don't buy an Xbox to put on a mantelpiece and say, here, I have a gaming platform. You buy it for what you can do with it. So you buy the embedded service of it being the host device to play games. Same with the textbook. You buy the textbook for the embedded service of the self-teaching that's available in there, but you also buy the textbook for the ideas that are contained within those pages. So product's a big concept area that once you get to thinking about it and you start looking at it, it becomes a particularly useful way for analyzing both your own consumption experience and it sets you up for a couple of assessment tasks. So we talk about a couple of the types of products Again, the physicality to intangibility is the main metric we use here. If it's physical, if you can use any of your five senses on it, it's in the goods category. If it happens to you and you experience it, it's down on the services end. We also have a couple other categories. We have the business to business, which we have a whole chapter on. We have the nonprofits, which are a unique form of service. We have the ideas which is the concepts, the notion of, say, equality, freedom, liberté. Uh, we have behaviours, the way in which we cross a road. We stop, wait for a lit signal to say we should continue, we should continue on our walking path. It's a behaviour and an idea bundled together. The behaviour is stop and wait. The idea is the car has precedent over the person. We also have the idea of selling places. When we get into tourism, tourism marketing, there's a whole set of advanced work on that. And we have this concept of people, people as a product. 
and this gets us into the musicians, the celebrities, the politicians, were people and the quasi-social interaction, the sense that this person, the celebrity, their life and their life being interesting to you is a product that we can sell and offer. Now, again, another key term that's important here is the concept of value. Again, value has a specific term in marketing language. So for us, marketers talk of value in terms of the benefits the customer receives from buying and using. So the value is often co-created. So the value doesn't exist until a consumer takes active steps and takes part. So merely buying a pair of shoes doesn't necessarily give you, it gives you one type of value, it's the value of ownership. Yes, you have this pair of shoes, they sit in your wardrobe. The value in use is when you get to use those shoes to go for the job interview and they're good nick and they impress the interviewer and you get a job. I don't think shoes are that important, but still. Similarly, value in use and value in ownership, complicated aspects to marketing. A lot of work's been done on it in the last 10 years, but it comes down to what is it that the customer gets from the product offer and is that equal to or better than the price that we're asking them to pay for it. Now, value being as is a multifaceted term in marketing also refers to, in this case, with the customer, from the marketer's perspective, what is the value of a customer? Now we have this element of the customer's co-creator, meaning the customer has a role in the process. Facebook would fall flat tomorrow if we stopped playing our role as partners. We provide the reason, we provide the content. Facebook provides the intermediary platform. If Facebook went away, we would find some other way of sharing. If we went away, Facebook wouldn't be able to find another way of getting content. So the user is actually a very powerful, in a very powerful position there. And this value of the customer is that they are the partner. We also have this idea of the lifetime value of a customer where we take a person and run them through a mathematical formula to work out whether we want to keep them or whether we want to go and get new customers. But we deal more with that when we uh, talk about services, pricing, and product later. All right, a couple of the technicals of the strategic side, the competitive advantage. This is an area where we look at it from the point of view of, in marketing, we are in a competitive marketplace. And one of the aspects that we need to be able to come to terms with is, we need to be better than our competition if we want someone to buy our product. In terms of a competitive advantage, one of the things you're looking for is you can have the advantage on your side as a marketer, your organization can have the advantage in something it does. It can be quicker, faster, better, cheaper. There is something that your marketing does that gives you an edge of your opponents. If you are cheaper, more effective or more efficient than your opponents, so for every $5 that you sell and they sell, they get $4 of profit, you get, so they get have $4 of cost, you have $3 of cost, they get a dollar of profit, you get $2 of profit, you are twice as effective. So that's your competitive edge. Or your product might do something that nobody else's product does, or something that's difficult to replicate in other people's products. And this is where things like brand, reputation, and image become the benefit. Yes, you can replicate every single system function that the Apple iPhone has. You'll break a few patents, but you won't be Apple. You won't have that reputation. Even if you've got the same sort of all the parts, everything minus the Apple logo, you won't have the same advantage that that firm has by virtue of they're completely intangible, completely abstract reputation. So they have an advantage on an idea, not a physical object.
Another big conceptual framework which we want to get out early and get you thinking about, the value chain. Now, the value chain mentioned here, it comes up again in strategy, it comes up again in planning, it comes up again in distribution. But basically, this is a heads up. Think about this idea of how is value created in the marketing operation. Is it created when from the supplier in how we deal with what we do uh, and what we create. So you know, from a McDonald's point of view, is the value from the farmers, is the value from the way McDonald's handles its supply chains and the fact it's open 24 seven? Is it the logistics of they can distribute anywhere in the country effectively? Is it the sales and marketing? Is it the price, the product, the promotion, the place? What is it that adds value, that makes it beneficial? So the value chain, again, comes back. It's a concept we're raising now. Say, heads up, this is important in the future. In another aspect of heads up, this is going to count. This is going to be interesting. For those of you who go on to do a full marketing major, the marketing planning part really comes into its own in the marketing strategy subject. We'll talk again about marketing planning in the strategy chapter. But what we're looking at here is that the idea of thinking about marketing. And the planning processes of marketing are, as we said in the definition, marketing is an activity and marketing is a process. Planning is part of that process. So we look at questions like, what will the customer want tomorrow? What are they want, going to want next year? What are the future directions? What are the environmental impacts? What are the factors that we need to address? What's changing in the world? So planning, again, this is a heads up. This becomes, it picks up in chapter two, but it's also a way of thinking that permeates the whole of the marketing major. The marketing plan, I'd just like to say, this is your introduction, but your only experience the marketing plan in intro. You are not being tasked with marketing plan in this subject because it's a big, complicated and ugly task. The plan is the documentation of the planning of the outcomes of the planning process. And if you haven't done a lot of marketing, you can't really produce one of these things without a lot of suffering. And we don't need to do that to you. So be aware, planning asks the questions. The marketing plan documents your answers for a specific market. Speaking of market segments, this is the big one. I'll tell you now, this is a dead set certain for an assessment task or an exam question. Segmentation is critical. Marketing is premised on the idea that we make an offer to a group of people who will respond in a similar manner. And the target market is who's our priority. Who's the group of people in the market that we are going to be able to make an offer to who will respond to that offer and we will both benefit. We also have the market segments, which is a way of seeing the world, a way of seeing the environment in which you are going to be operating and to say, are there discrete and distinct clusters of people who will react the same way to our offer? And if there are, we should make offers directly to them. You will always be tasked as a marketer with slicing up the market into smaller and smaller segments until those segments are either indistinguishable from each other or an individual. So you can have a target market of one. You can have a market segment of one. If that one is a big enough client and big enough buyer, you don't need a second customer. So segmentation can go right down to the core of an individual. And it's really important that you have this concept of who do I want to target really clearly thought out. You want to understand that person. You don't want to just be saying, uh, people in South Australia. Yeah, that would do. You want to be breaking it down into age, demographics, purchasing. What is the benefit they're seeking? What's the need we're addressing? What is the want we're addressing? We really want to have you thinking in terms of how do we have these really clearly thought out targets that we want to be addressing?
All right, the final aspect of marketing, the marketing mix. Now we have dedicated chapters for product, pricing, and place. And we have a suite of dedicated chapters, three of them for promotion. So this is your heads up. The marketing mix is really important and it's one of the fundamental critical elements of the marketing. But this is your precursor. You are going to now, after this chapter, get access to a whole series of background information that helps you make up your mind, make decisions, think through a series of, of planning processes and planning ideas that then take shape and take fruition in the marketing mix. So we're introducing you to the mix now, and I really want you to focus when you're reading this section of the book, this is a really critical section, that if you understand the overview that we give you at this phase, as you step through the next steps of planning decisions and process decisions, you'll be able to start seeing the wires, drawing the connections together. So that when you're looking into the segmentation strategy, you're going, well, should we segment on place, on promotion, on price? What of seg market segmentation can I use to guide me in setting up my product strategy? And what from my product strategy can help me with my segmentation? So briefly an overview, product, product is the value offer, it's the center piece. If there is no product, there is no offer, there's no marketing. You can pretty much get away without having anything else, including distribution, but if you don't have a product, you don't have marketing. There are three layers to it, the core, the actual, and the augmented. The core is the need or want that is being addressed. Again, as far as areas of marketing that are really on the surface sound simple but very complex to actually implement, deciding what your core product offering is has been a pitfall for many students because you're not talking about what the product is, you're talking about what the consumer does with your product to solve a problem. So for a car, the core value might be prestige. It might be ego. It might be transport. It might be storage. Whatever it is that's that core is what the customer is buying to achieve through use or ownership. The second tier up is the actual product. This is what the product's made of. So from the car's perspective, it's the tires, the wheels, the brand, whether it's got speakers in it, how many doors, how many wheels, those are the actual elements. The augmented are things like the brand, the service, the aftermarket. These are the elements that are not central to the product, but to enhance the product's value. Price, price is a big area where we spend a bit of time because there's the financial price, which is the money, and there's the non-financial price, and this is one of my favorite areas, is the idea of how much does it cost you in time. So if you're looking at this course, you think, how much does it cost you financially? How much does it cost you in time? What's the lifestyle cost of having to study? What are you having to forego? What are your opportunity costs? If you want to take up a new sport, what's your time cost? How many hours for training, performing? What's the social cost? Oh, look, yeah, sorry, can't come out tonight, so I've got training. Or can't come out tonight, I've got a game tomorrow. What are the lifestyle costs? What do you have to do in terms of changing your life to use this product? So these are interesting areas. And again, it's not just about the money. Distribution and place. This is not the glamorous end, but it's one of the critical ends. It's the workhorse. All other marketing is visible. Done well, place is invisible. Place happens. As far as the consumer is concerned, they walk into the store, stuff is on the shelf. You don't think about it. You don't walk in and go, wow, nice logistics. You had the product when I needed it. The only time you notice as a consumer is when place fails and you walk in and go, I wanted that, but it's not here. So this is one of the critical aspects. It's the magician's other hand. It's the hidden element. 
You get it right, nobody notices, and your job's been done well. Lastly, when we talk about stage magic, there is the hand that we ask you to pay attention to, and then there's the hand that does the work. Promotion is the hand we ask you to pay attention to. There's a lot of stuff in here. There's three chapters worth of coverage, but basically promotion is the big visible item that tells you, that communicates the value offering, communicates the existence. Sometimes communicates the existence of the want and says, hey, this is a way you can solve that want. Sometimes it communicates the existence of the product or changes in the product, newer, cheaper, faster, on sale. But ultimately, it is the big high ticket, high profile event that you're supposed to see. You're supposed to look at promotion and you're not supposed to see distribution. And we prefer if you didn't notice price, but price and product come together so that when you get something that is your exchange of value. But promotions are really, if all you think of, of marketing before you arrive in this course is it's about advertising and promotion, then promotion's doing its job well by being the big visible part. And that's chapter one. So for those of you who have had questions along the way, the Twitter or email or Formspring, basically this chapter is the overview of overviews. Introduction to marketing is a summary overview and it's a sample of the theories and ideas that you go into depth in seven other subjects in the major. This chapter is the summary summary. So from here, we'll start getting into depth and detail. If you have any questions, fire them away on email, connect on Twitter, or ask me a question on Formstring.